गुड इवनिंग एवरीबडी वेलकम अगेन टू टू डेज इवनिंग वेबिनार टूडे वी आर गोइंग टू हैव अ टॉक बाय प्रोफेसर आनंद किशोर पाल फ्रॉम कोलकाता हुज गोइंग टू टॉक टू अस अबाउट द रीसेंट एडवांसेस इन ऑर्थोपेडिक सर्जरी एंड ही इज गोइंग टू टेक अ सर्टेन फ्यू टॉपिक्स व्हिच ही फील्स आर इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर ऑल द पोस्ट ग्रेजुएट्स टू लर्न अबाउट बिफोर द एग्जाम सो आई थिंक डॉक्टर ए के पाल नीड्स नो इंट्रोडक्शन for this particular uh, meeting because he has been here many times and uh, it it's always a pleasure to listen to him so over to you dr pal <clears throat> okay good evening good evening dr jung so i'm extremely thankful for to you for this uh, this platform this is really helpful for the post graduates so without uh, wasting your time i'm just i want to start my lecture <clears throat> is it visible now Yeah, yes sir. visible but visible? your sound is sound is a little uh, okay okay uh, broken so, up so yeah just check okay so this is we start the recent advances in orthopedics which is a very very important uh, not only in the post graduate uh, theory examination but also in the practical also they may be asked uh, different questions so first of all we have to uh, to start how to write the recent advances this is extremely important so this is the most important general uh, um, uh, consideration in any type of theory questions so we have to uh, this is the general principles write on the, the on the on the right half of the paper keeping left side of, of the of those paper blank initially <clears throat> because left side will be utilized to write the main heading or the subheading like chart flow chart table schematic diagram etc so that will uh, that will make your uh, your your, uh, your um, writing is much more uh, ornamentable and that will be presentable and that will carry much more marks uh, for you okay and always segment your answer always segment so that that will be easy for the examiner to give the marks and also read the paper and that will increase your impression also not only that you can use the multiple color except the red color for highlighting the facts <clears throat> like the introduction you how to segment uh, your uh, any type of questions like introduction like in introduction that indicates the existing knowledge and its shortcomings next the need <clears throat> for advancement next the op options for the improvement next is the importance or place of this one so how it uh, differs from the previous uh, one next is the description the description of this uh, um, of this uh, specific technique or the or any any term and you have to start with its indication and the contraindication next is the advantage and disadvantage so in this way this is a standard segmentation of any type of items which has to be written in your theory questions so this is most important so i will start the my first topic there are several topics i uh, actually i don't know how much it can be discussed i think there this recent advances is most prob problem of the recent advances is <clears throat> most of the cases these are not, not usually seen in the book and these are the actually the, the information should be gathered from different um, sources and um, that should be that should be specified uh, in a, in, a, in a specific uh, manner and um, so this is very important so how far we can uh, discuss those so we can discuss after that we'll take the uh, the interaction from the uh, students and after that we can if, if you it can continue there are several topics so first topic is the biological therapy for the tendon regeneration in the chronic tendinopathy so we have to start with the interactions like the tendon healing it occurs in the three stages like inflammation proliferation and remodeling tendon tendinopathy develops if the healing becomes a plateau or the halted in the stage of the proliferation that is the middle stage or angiogenesis stage and presented as a chronic disease with progressive degeneration of the extra extracellular matrix micro tearing and the loss of the tendon architecture now failure in remodeling process and the tissue maturation is also reported by some authors like there are some tendons show the mucoid hyaline and the fibrous degeneration now these are the basically these are tendinopathy how they present the patient pres presents with pain tenderness and the functional limitation now what is the basis of the biologic therapy biology therapy basically that means activated resident what is the basis is the activate resident cells of, of the tendons like the tenocytes and the tendon progenitor cells these are basically these are the main stay which can produce some healing of the tendons okay. so the activation of such cells is the key factor 
or the healing of such cases. So biological treatment, basically that concentrated on the platelet rich plasma or that any, any type, any which, which has acts as a uh, stimulating factor so by providing the growth or growth factors on the, which is directly targeted on those cells, which has, which is capable for the healing. Uh, so this is the most important. Now, next is I have already told we have to before going to the advanced uh, treatment we have to understand uh, why the the standard treatments are not uh, effective and what are the exi existing treatment. Now the existing treatment of such tendinopathies are local corticosteroid injections. These are basically now it is outdated because that produce some uh, some uh, tendon rupture, especially for the lower limb. Uh, next is the lower local RST that was the temporary relief, dry needling, ultrasound therapy, laser therapy, extracorporeal shockwave. They all they all produce some temporary relief, but they cannot produce some actual healing. That is production of the extracellular matrix. That is why there is a there is a place of the biologics. Now, what is the what is the main step? The PRP is defined as a plasma with a platelet count above the peripheral blood, can uh, obtained in the center obtained by centrifugation. That means that the, the that concentrate that must have the platelets, which have at least at least three to five times much more than the normal uh, peripheral blood, because that produce some growth factors and the cytokines released from the plasma proteins that modulate the cell wave that targeted directly on the on the cells of the tendons by production synthesis of the extracellular matrix and reduction of the inflammation as also angiogenesis. Next is the PRP we measure. These are the first generation PRP. This is known as the first generation PRP. The, the, the uh, second generation PRP is basically it is gonna it, it, some combination. PRP is coming with some combination like PRP with PR platelet rich fibrin or platelet rich with mesenchymal cell therapies, platelet rich uh, plasma combined with a uh, cartogenin, where they, if, it had, if you add it, they can stimulate the fibroblast for production of the fibrocartilage for the healing. And then lastly, the stem cells. These are these are these are uh, the advanced uh, advanced therapy, biological therapy. And lastly, the exosomes. Exosomes is basically these are basically the extracellular organelle. They stimulate the gene for the activation of the mesenchymal stem cells to India to enhance the proliferation, uh, migration, as also the differentiation of the tenocytes for the healing. So these are the uh, different options of the biologics. But where we are practically, we have uh, we have uh, we have we, we are uh, concentrated on the platelet-rich plasma. Now, what is the mechanism of the platelet-rich plasma? Because they have three types of mechanism, like cell-specific action, the platelet-rich uh, there is platelet activating factor, which is now basically as a secrotome released from the alpha granules, and or their direct effect on the peripheral tissues, uh, which is already present in the, in the site of the tendinopathy. Now, cell-specific uh, cell action is that may act on the T-cells and the macrophage. They holds the differentiation. Thus, they holds the progress of the inflammation. This is the most important because I've already told what is the basic problem. Basic problem is the pro there's a prolonged inflammation. So, inflammation should be halted first. And this is the main uh, function of that. They hold the inflammation. Next, they modulate the inflammation, uh, proliferation, differentiation, apoptosis, and matrix anabolism. They are, thus they help the healing. This is most important. And uh, not only that, the bound peripheral tissue, thereby uh, modification of the cytokine profile, they remove the signals of the inflammation or the they, they, um, or ECM catabolism. So that so that the, it prevents the destruction also. So in this way, they make, make a congenial environment for the healing. So this is the way the, why the, this uh, this uh, schematic diagram is given. So anybody, if if uh, if student they wants, they can draw this diagram. So basically, see these are the platelet derived growth factors. Basically, there are several growth factors. Most important growth factors are those they are liberated from the alpha granules. They can be usually uh, in this manner. You can easily draw draw it in your own way. So this is uh, this is why it is given. Now the action of the PRP in the cellular level. I've already told, so in your line, you have to highlight this, but without uh, the red uh, red color. So that is how it is given. So see these actions, it provides the growth factor. It can enhance the mobilization of the stem cells. It increases the proliferation of the tendon cells, as well as the, it causes the signaling actions of the cytokines and the chemokines. Chemo 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 so in between this line, if I highlight this in this manner, not, not, not the, the different colors, we can use the, the, the blue, color uh, green color any color so it is easy to understand this is very uh, easy to um, take this now what are the indications 
like it in indication is Achilles tendinopathy, patellar tendinopathy, rotator cuff tendinopathy. You can add the, the, the different conditions where it is seen like the patellar tendinopathy is related with the jumping actions. Okay, so this way you can uh, write it down. So these are the actual indications. Now there are different types of classification I already told, which is already it is in the practice, like pure pla uh, platelet rich plasma or leukocyte, poor platelet rich plasma. Is the, uh, these are first generation. PRP, whereas the leukocyte and the PRP, the, 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 the leukocyte rich plasma, I'm showing, I, I'll show, discuss how the PRP can contain the leukocyte. Basically, both are these, the, these two, one is the, the first generation PRP, one is the low leukocyte count, another is the high leukocyte count. So if the presence of leukocyte is basically, it is advantageous because that will that will prevent the infection in this process because we are injecting something from the outside. So the presence of leukocyte is beneficial, some, uh, some authors suggest. Now, uh, the second generation is, is the platelet plus combination. Platelet something has been added with the platelet, like the platelet-rich fibrin. So if the platelet is combined with the leukocyte and this platelet is fibrin. Uh, so this is known as the second generation PRP. So this fibrin actually basically helps uh, they, they stimulate the fibroblast. So the, 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 uh, initially that puts a high density fibrin network that will help in uh, healing of this uh, tendon. Now, how the technique of separation? This is the general. This is standard autoclave, uh, standard uh, centrifugation. Has the upper part is the pl plasma layer, lower part is RBC, and it's the buffy coat is containing the basically the platelets and the WBC. Now there are two system, uh, the specialized modified centrifugation. We can use the buffy coat system and the plasma based system. Uh, is the core system and the plasma based system. These are two methods. So you can see here basically how they decode this system. It contains both the plasma, uh, the platelets, as also the limb neutrophils. Whereas in the, in the plasma based PRP, basically it contains the only the platelets. So if you want to give the, the only the platelets only, the, if there is absolutely no uh, no inf uh, chance of infection. So in that case, the plasma based PRP is the best form. Whereas if there is a chance of infection may be considered, we can use this buffy coat PRP. But in the, in the, in the function wise, plasma based PRP is the most important because this is a pure uh, uh, the uh, platelets is there would be there and uh, that is only the platelets will be provided with their growth factors. So basically how it can be provided. So th this, uh, the blood is initially there, uh, they are, they are centrifugal fused in a twice First centrifugation is done by the soft spin, which is a very uh, low rotation in between the, the 200, 300 to uh, uh, 1500 rotation is known as a soft spin. Soft spin is required for to separate the RBC. After that, when the supernatant fluid, which it is again, it is taken out, and that is again, there is a second um, centrifugation is done by the hard spin, where there is 3000 to 600, 6000 RPM, it is rotation is done. So if it is a lower, uh, lower uh, rotation, in the lower rotation, uh, we can obtain the PRP plus WBC. But if it is, if you use the higher RPM, that is almost 6,000 RPM. So in that case, only the PRP will be there. So in this way, we can divide whether we can uh, have both the PRP plus WBC or the only PRP. Now, this is again, there are some, uh, what are the PRP method? This is given, there's a penny puncture, do not chill the blood like this. So it is, by this way, it, if you highlight this, this see this, uh, this is the simple highlighting, that like the penny puncture, do not chill the blood, use the soft spin, transfer the supernatant fluid. Next, the hard spin, I, have, as I just I have told, lower one, after the hard spin, lower one third is the basically the PRP and upper two third is the platelet poor plasma. So, uh, these are, so after that, you have to discard the upper two third and only we have to take the lower one third. So remove the P where this PRP and the suspend the platelet uh, pellets. This is most important, lower one third is basically the pure uh, P, uh, PRP. Now, buffy coat method, I'm not going to detail because this is not uh, uh, not very good. So I've already told. And the preparation, see, there is a there are some I have given some uh, results. If you want to give, this is not mandatory. If you want, you can give them results. Uh, in the especially in the tendon Achilles tendinopathy, where the after injection, this is a post-operative protocol. You have to add some some stretching exercises by two weeks, followed by full return of the play within six weeks. So this is most important and PIP is found efficacious in a young to middle aged patients with non-insertional tendoachylis tendinopathy compared to the old aged patients. This is the uh, one results I have given. So if anyone you can give that. So this is the way we have to use this one. 
Now there's another uh, recent advances has come is the all inside ACL reconstruction technique. So how to start with the introduction, we have to use this ACL reconstruction. What are the options of the graph? Like we can use the hamstring graph, there's a bone, uh, uh, battle tendon bone graph, the quadriceps and the allograph. The most common technical error in the ACL reconstruction is, is the femoral tunnel malposition. This is most important. Why that is in the beginning I have told why, why it is required, why the recent advances is required that would highlight. So that is the most important. Femoral tunnel malposition is most important. And there are several techniques of the femoral tunnel malposition, as you can see here. Need of all inside techniques is a because there is a problem of femoral tunnel preparation by the outside in or the this tibial uh, tunnel uh, trans tibial procedure as you can see here there are several uh, problem is there so uh, in this way so as there is several problem of production of the femoral tunnel and the femoral tunnel is basically the, it, it dictates its uh, success uh, in the in the post operative uh, recovery that is why the all inside technique is uh, inter used and the all inside uh, acl reconstruction is technique is a relatively a new minimally invasive method in which the both the femoral and tibial tunnels are drilled from inside the joint and first described by the morgan in 1995 the technique is basically characterized by creation of the socket so I have selected this uh, schematic diagram because it is very easy to draw by any 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 uh, student. So this we see this creation of the socket is done from the inside, not the outside in. So this is the basically differentiate from the other technique. Uh, now this this is the uh, um, all the tunnels, both the tunnels, the tibial tunnels and the femoral tunnels. They are made from the from the inside and a graft introduced to the knee through the arthroscopic portal. And when the um, the special care is basically to protect this uh, cancer as bone during this drilling. This is most important. Otherwise, there is a possibility of uh, loosening. And but that so this is extremely important. So uh, so that will uh, that will obviate. There are several uh, complications from which is uh, usually seen from out, which is done from the outside in, uh, but the, there are some disadvantage also. So, so there are advantages. Basically, it is, it is a extremely improved cosmesis. The similar smaller incision preserves the bone through the creation of the half tunnels, which is useful for the multi ligament injuries, and no need of to hyperflex the knee. It is most important for femoral tunnel creation and post operative pain and swelling are reduced as the cortex and peritoneum are not violated. And for the multiple femoral tunnels in the multi-ligament injuries, there is the increased intraosseous bone bridge between them. So that is also the advantages. But the disadvantage is all already there because we have to provide the, I already told special care should be taken during this tunnel. So there should not be any loosening. Otherwise, there is a bungee cord phenomenon or the windshield wiper effect. What is that? So for that, you have to understand this. If we make a lax on this, see, they, see this, uh, these grafted ligaments, they are make, they are, the tensioning is done by holding the stitch at the end, isn't it? So during the movements, as the bungee jumping, what is happening? There, there are jumps and again, they come um, again up and up and down, up and down. So there is a little bit, if it is a lax on, there is a high, the high sense of going up and down movement. So there's the bung, bungee jump movement or there's a windshield wiper effect like this. The why, what is happening in the windshield uh, wiper during of the running car? You know, the, in the when it is runs inside the uh, in the rain, same thing is happening over there during the flexion and extension movement. So that is the disadvantage. Uh, so this is the, the most important. So we have to make a absolutely, um, absolutely uh, tensioning, absolutely proper tensioning during the procedure. So that is requires the steeper learning curve. Cost is relatively higher. So this is the in this way you have to uh, consider this F. Now next another question is the high tibial osteotomy. Different types of high tibial osteotomy. Discuss the various types of high tibial osteotomies and their effect on the tibial slope and the patella height. Now again you can start with the introduction why it is required. So the so in in, a, uh, in which stage of the osteoarthrosis basically it is done uh, to just to change the mechanical axis deviation is especially when the osteoarthrosis is unicompartmental. But whether whether it is a bike so in this way you have to start with the introduction. I'm just dis I'm, uh, discuss with the description. See, in this manner, you can easily differentiate the high tibial osteotomy uh, that, that can, be, it can be used for correction of the coronal plane correction or sagittal correction or for rotational correction. If it's a coronal plane correction, it may be required for the various uh, valgus producing osteotomy or the various producing osteotomy. For valgus, you have to make a medial open wedge or the lateral closing wedge. Whereas in the valgus, a various production osteotomy, you can do the medial closing wedge or the lateral open wedge. So in this, it is very easy to make this uh, this uh, this uh, uh, this flowchart. 
for the sagittal plane correction for the increasing posterior tibial slope we have to do the anterior opening wedge whereas in the decreasing post posterior slope we have to do the anterior closing wedge for the rotational correction we have to tibial tubercle osteotomy for the patellar maltracking well, or there's another option is derotation osteotomy for the abnormal tibial torsion <clears throat> so it is very easy to um, the differentiate this <clears throat> if we make this there is no uh, chance of making the uh, much, much more uh, time consuming so now this is a, uh, how to differentiate this medial opening wedge and the lateral closing wedge. See these are see that the points most commonly performed from HTO, but this advantage is this advantage is a preserve the bone stock for the future conversion of the TK. Whereas it, that causes uh, that affects the uh, the TK uh, procedure uh, for this lateral closing wedge osteotomy. So in this way, this is, these are the points by which we can easily differentiate uh, from this medial opening wedge. You can uh, can draw the diagram also. Uh, so it's very easy. It's very lucrative for the uh, examiner. Now, what are the other types of HTO like various producing HTO? There is less common as most valgus deformities around the knee arise from the uh, femur. Various producing HTO that cause a joint plane obliquity in these cases. Now, the slope uh, slope changing osteo, high, high tibial osteotomy, maybe anterior closing wedge. Indications is revision ACL, where there is a posterior tibial slope is more than 20 degree. Okay. Contraindication is, is the genuine recovery term with hyper extraction more than 10 degree. Whereas the anterior opening wedge indication revision of the primary, uh, there's a the PCL uh, the, uh, reconstruction with uh, this posterior tibial stop is less than 20 degree. So in this way, we can divide, we can easily, the, um, the indication and contraindication can be the same thing you can do, uh, draw in the, in, the, in, the, in the flow chart. And, and lastly, the tibial tubercle osteotomy distalization. It is the, when the cation distemper index is uh, more than 1.2, that is in the patella baja. In the, uh, especially in those cases, tibial tubercle osteotomy can be done. Anterior medialization, TTG distance, medialization. So this, in this way, you can easily uh, the, um, write it down. Now, effect, <clears throat> what are the differences, what are the problems? The effect on patellar high, this is the most important. For the medial open wedge osteotomy, see, it can be either that is the result of the patellar baja or the patellar femoral osteoarthritis. So how to correct it? So to correct by descending biplane cart is required as for the medial opening wedge high tibial osteotomy. Whereas the lateral closing wedge osteotomy that lead to patellar alter and that can do patellar instability, sorry, patellar instability. Uh, so, uh, so that you have to take care of. Now, effect of the tibial slope. So, so, uh, so if, if the if the posterior gap is closed more quickly, uh, so so that leads to increased slope. So it is most important. So hence, the, 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 we have to make the posterior opening twice that of the anterior opening. This is most important for the medial open wedge. Whereas in the, in, in the lateral close wedge osteotomy, tibial slope is usually reduced. So if the closing wedge is not exactly perpendicular to the anatomical axis, more bone is resected anteriorly, resulting in the decreased slope. So these are the technical considerations we have to keep it in mind. So that can be, again, it, that can be done in a, in a, in a uh, sentence or in a uh, flowchart manner. Next is the, this is another question. It is, uh, it is came in the recent advances. This is a musculoskeletal symptoms of the sars cov 2 so you have to how to introduce uh, start with the introduction so the global pandemic causes by sars cov you can write it down when it comes or anything else but it can reach, it can cause several problems of the musculoskeletal so 15 to 20% of the all covid patients exhibit some musculoskeletal symptoms what are the responsible factors basically that the, the, the systemic inflammation that uh, not only helps and uh, not only affects the the other parts of the body but also the bones and the soft tissues and the articular surface Effects of the therapeutics used in the COVID as also the intensive care unit acquired weakness. So that is also most important. Now, systemic inflammatory effect, how it affects the musculoskeletal disease because uh, SARS-CoV basically it will as the AC2 receptors. They actually, they, by which uh, they cause the apoptosis leading to local inflammation. And basically that leads to decreased bone mass and the joint inflammation. And not only that, COVID-19, uh, the virus that induces the hypoxia of the all the cells by the several uh, markers, uh, several markers like the this this are the, these are the uh, these markers to so the inflammatory cytokines which activate the osteoclast and decrease the osteogenesis by the osteoblast, leading to the increased bone resorption, the increased bone uh, decreased bone formation. So there is an overall osteopenia. And then that this is all the, all the symptoms that can that may be associated with osteomalacia or the osteoporosis. So and you can write it down from that. 
Next is the uh, musculoskeletal symptoms, which are uh, related with the therapeutics. The about uh, that's it, uh, that is treatment if uh, that is side effect of the treatment used for the COVID. Prolonged corticosteroid use in the COVID is related with the osteonecrosis of the femoral head. This is the most important. Whereas uh, there are several uh, joint replacement is uh, ideally required. Next is uh, the reduced bone mineral density and osteoporosis. That's the uh, explanation is just we discussed. Corticosteroids have been reported to cause the muscle atrophy and the muscle weakness. Next is the chloroquine and the hydroxychloroquine that uh, is really directly related with the myopathy and the neuropathy. And so, so in that case, in this way, you can easily uh, write it down. What is the, how to differentiate between the myopathy and the neuropathy? What are the different uh, uh, treatment like that? So in this way, you can uh, elaborate like that if you want to elaborate. Next is the antivirals like the lopinavir, ritonavir, and the rivavirin. They have associated with the arthralgy of back pain as also the osteonecrosis. So this is also important. So you can uh, write it down by your own. Now the intensive care unit associated weakness. This is the ICU AW term is given. Uh, this is consisting of the critical illness polyneuropathy, critical illness myopathy, or the that is critical illness polyneuropathy. So this is most important. And there's a uh, COVID-19 induced inflammation may lead to cytokine storm, which causes the microvascular derangement. So that may lead to the catastrophe or better to some uh, co um, severe co um, comorbidities like the polyneuropathy and the myopathy. It may be diagnosed with the EMG as also the single nerve conduction studies. That's occasionally associated with the elevated creatine kinase, D-dimer levels, and the lymphopenia. So these are the basic things I have given. And if anyone, if you want to elaborate, so there are several diseases, how to differentiate in, uh, the neuropathy from uh, some uh, myopathy, what are the different um, treatments, uh, you can el elaborate. Now the next another uh, question is the ceramics at the uh, as a bearing surface. So this is the first introduction is, is the French surgeon Pierre Boutin, 1970. Bearing made of the cer ceramic processes, extremely low wear rates. This is most important. Ceramics have the high compression strength, hardness, and chemically inert, resistant to corrosion, and the stubble over the long term in the vivo. They're, they're, they have a polar hydroxyl group that promotes the interaction with the body fluids to provide a lubricating layer. However, they are brittle and prone to failure under the tensile stress leading to catastrophic failure. That is why they require some, uh, some uh, combination of uh, different metals. So what are the types of the ceramics, like the alumina ceramics, zirconia ceramics, or the alumina zirconia composites? So alumina ceramics most commonly used is the, is the biolog sport, the risk of catastrophic failure in one in uh, 25,000. That is why there came the zirconia, zirconia ceramics, the three times stronger than the alumina ceramic. And lastly, the alumina zirconia composites, zirconia toughened alumina, which shows the bitter resistance to fracture, which is uh, basically biolog delta, which is commonly in, you know, in clinical practice. Now, the uh, indications is the young and active patients who require the hip replacements, and especially the, the younger patients who have a very hefty uh, uh, body, the high body weight. So this is most important. So no specific cutter because based on the chronological, psychological and the activity level. Now, the contraindications are there also, like elderly, the informed patients where so the longevity and activity level is limited. Ceramic bearing can be infected in limited range of the head diameter. Is the patient's requiring the large diameter head it is sometimes not to be chosen. Ceramic uh, vestibular components are not available in the constant design, hence the patients with the instability may not be suited. And they see there are some workout. So in this way, we can uh, write it down, the ceramic on ceramic. Uh, now, surgical considerations, the minimal, there are several uh, surgical considerations. Uh, specifically, basically, head should be installed in a clean, dry stem, uh, should not be any scratch proof. Installation of the ceramic liner must be in perfect alignment. Uh, so with the metal cup, this is most important. But eccentric loading may carefully to avoid the contact of the ceramic edge. So these are the basic uh, surgical step which should be kept in your mind. So, and again, there are some complications uh, like the unexpected catastrophic failure of the first generation bearing was the most dreaded complication. And audible squeaking may be very uh, irritating uh, for the uh, persons. So, so you have to be very, uh, very much aware of that. You have to counsel properly uh, for the patients. Now the electrical properties and, and the uh, electrical use, uh, electri use for osteogenesis may be uh, is, is usually, it is uh, another topic. 
So how to uh, start the introduction? Bone is an electro electronically active tissue. Electrical properties of the bone arising from the interaction between the different cell types like the osteocyte, osteoblast, osteoclast, and the extracellular matrix and the other various uh, uh, physiological and the pathological conditions. And what are the different types of this uh, property of the bone? Basically, they have the dielectric or the piezoelectric property. So what is the dielectric property of the bone? Dielectric property is a bone is a dielectric material, meaning that it's a non-conducting, but is able to display the polarization of the positive and negative charges upon application of the electrical field. So if the electrical field is, uh, is passed across the bone, so, so the, in the tension side, there's a production of the positive charge, which are the cause of depolarization and to the biomarkers, they, they are basically, they, there's osteoclastogenesis as, as, as occurring. Whereas the compression side, they basically that to produce a negative charge. There's a hyperpolarization. So through the RAS activation and the biomarker, they produce osteogenesis. That is why in the compression side, there is a much more bone is formed. And so that is why there, there are some uh, in the media, the, the concave side, they see there's a, there is uh, the, the, the uh, more, much more bone is formed on the compression side, whereas the tensile side, there is a less bone is formed. So this is the dielectric properties. And basically it is affected by the bone mineral density and can be used to measure this bone mineral density using the imp uh, this impedance spectroscopy. So this is the, uh, the dielectric property. Now, what is the piezoelectric property? Piezoelectric materials generate the electric field in response to the mechanical stress. So that is the natural process. And then we have to keep in mind this piezoelectric material property uh, during once we, tre we treat that. So tension side generates the positive charges and the compression side promotes the bone formation by generating the negative charges. So how can it be applied on the on, on our uh, practice? So they're basically, uh, the, there are three types, uh, the bone healing basically, how it helps by the electrical property. This electrophysiological environment of the fracture site is important for conversion of the pro-inflammatory M1 macrophage to pro-healing M2 macrophage with help in fracture healing. This is the basis. This, uh, this, this, uh, that there's a connection between the electrical property as well as the pathological property. And so there are three methods of administering the electric current to the bone. It may be either direct current or a capacitive coupling or the inductive coupling. So, so what is the direct current? So it's basically the surgically implanted electrode. The, the, so electrode is implanted and through which the current is applied. The, basically, there are uh, several problems like risk of infection, tissue reaction, some of that, but in some case of recalcitrant TPL non-union that can be used for that. Mm, okay. Now, this is the capacitive coupling. As you can see here, electrodes are placed over the skin and fixed with a cost and forming electrical field around the fracture side. Uh, so the, the, that they can that produce uh, uh, the st stimulation on the about the bones. Uh, so for production of the uh, bones as uh, depending on the piezoelectric property. Now it is a better compliance. Some evidence in the diaphyseal non-union as also in the osteotomy of the of the limb. And lastly, the inductive coupling. Inductive coupling you can see is one to the carrying coils are placed. These carrying coils, one or two carrying coils placed over the skin, and the pulse electromagnetic field is created, which stimulates the electric uh, stimulates the electrical uh, tissues of the bones nearby, and then that that produces the osteosynthesis. So it is a best compliance, some evidence in the spinal fusion, whereas in the osteotomies and the non of the distal uh, of, the, of the long bones that can be used. So in this way, the, the electrical property can be used for the osteosynthesis. Now the myoelectric uh, uh, prosthesis is also again, it can come. Uh, so how will it start the introduction? So you can, uh, you can draw this diagram, it's very easy to draw. And there are several, um, uh, several levels are uh, given, like the, this is very easy, this is a classification, this is a transcarpal amputation. Uh, myoelectric prosthesis, basically it is uh, meant for the upper limb prosthesis. So we have to draw this and we have to, uh, we have to make, uh, to classify the different types of, uh, of our amputation, upper limb amputation in this manner. And basically, the, the prosthesis, there are two types of uh, upper limb prosthesis, maybe passive prosthesis or the active prosthesis. Passive prosthesis, basically, which is in turn are divided into cosmetic uh, and or the functional uh, component. It doesn't have any, any movement, doesn't provide any movement. Whereas in the active prosthesis, that provides some movement, which include the, it may be body power prosthesis or the externally powered prosthesis, or, of which the myoelectric prosthesis is, it will come under this uh, heading that is active prosthesis. So 
um, for the for making our life easier, I have drawn this chart for the, my students. They anybody can take this. So this uh, this basically this uh, all the processes basically it may be body powered process, active process may be body powered processes or the externally powered processes. Body powered processes basically is controlled by the cables or the harness. And by, and by by moving the opposite part, the opposite part of the body or the opposite limb of the body, they can control the movement of the uh, that my uh, that processes. But it it, it requires some uh, energy, high expenditure of energy is required. But the externally powered processes basically it, it comes in the myoelectric. So externally powered processes and that basically depend on the battery. And that can be either myoelectric processes or the electric processes. Uh, electric processes basically uh, is controlled by the external buttons. It's usually done for the, uh, the focomelic uh, child. Whereas the myoelectric processes that can be used for the an um, all age group and that can be controlled by the, um, the electromyographic signals. So see, this is the active process, different types. This is the body powered processes. By moving the upper, uh, the opposite part of the body, they can control it. But it requires some severe energy consuming. But the myoelectric, depending on the on the on the electromyographic signals, and that can be in, uh, less power energy consuming. Uh, so by movement, the intention of the by simple intention of the movement, they can produce the signals of the electromagnetic signals, uh, which are easily sensors are inside that myoelectric processes. Even in a very very high amputation, they can be easily uh, try they if they able to move the hand. So basic functions. Uh, required for the myoelectric process is the motor functions, basically the grasping configuration or the neutral positions, complete hand opening is also important as also the movements like the rotation, slipping, translation, pointing index and the pushing point. Is, these are the um, basic motor functions. These are should be there in a myoelectric hand. And the sensory is also important like the tactile is also important and the temperature is a tactile and sensation temperature uh, must be sensor inside that uh, processes which will provide these uh, sensory components now uh, this control it will control either by the non invasive way or the invasive way basically that depends on the extraction the user's intention from the signals user's intention this is extremely important that may be uh, that may be uh, uh, received by the surface electromyographic electrodes which is already incorporated in the processes or by the ultrasound imaging or the force myography, or it may be implantable myoelectric sensors. New, there is neural interfaces. Of the most important, is a, is, it is a most modern is a targeted muscle innervation from the myoelectric interfaces in very proximal limb loss. So, in the, these are the, the all these are the system already provided in the, the myoelectric processes, which can receive the signals. On the user's intention, that means whether it should be grab or it should be okay, pointing index like that. And see if the intention is with there, so from the intention that the stimulates the inter interfacing system, and that is uh, taken by the electromyographic at the at the amputation stump, then that, that comes to the intention decoding, they come to the control system, then processes actuation system, and then when the process sensors they become activated. Once they are activated, they also control, they provide the uh, signals to the control system. And not only that, through the interfacing system, they they uh, they, they causes the specific function. So this is the way the my my electric processes is controlled. Uh, now um, uh, this how the tactile uh, sensation is also uh, now uh, also uh, uh, discharge that can be done by the, the the physical stimulus or by the neural stimulus like the vibrotactile electrotactile the mechanotactile but whether the vibron electrotactile maybe there is early adapted adaptation is possible whereas the mechanotactile sensors that may require much pressure so once there is a much pressure is applied on that processes, they can uh, understand something is uh, uh, is going to have uh, is, is is touching on that processes. Otherwise, some neural stimulus uh, that, that there is intraneural electrode may be applied, maybe uh, maybe provided on that electro processes for their um, for understanding. Now, in practice, what are the different myoelectric processes available in our um, in our uh, market. So basically the advanced path is a poly articulated myoelectric prosthetic hands like the ILM, B Bionic or the Michelangelo type of the three street uh, designs are available in our market. But the limitation is there is lack of the intuitive, intuitive, intuitive and the, the label interface 
able to map the user motion volition to real motion of the posters. So basically, they are making only single direction movement, single direction movement they are uh, they are providing. So limitation is a single degree of freedom. Uh, basically, so we require multiple degree of freedom. So they only provide the single degree of freedom. Uh, so performance is affected by the arm posture modification, electrode positioning, fatigue, inherent crosstalk in the surface signal, and the displacement of the muscles during the contraction. And uh, so how to improve? So there's a further advances. The further advance is the ultrasound imaging. There's a force myography or this, uh, this targeted uh, motor. Uh, there is a reconnection, as already told. Uh, and there's a pattern recognition technique or the neural signals acquired through the implantable neural interfaces. So these are the, the already, it, it is already under uh, consideration. These are the way by which we can improve the tactile sensation as also specific multi-directional degree of freedom of the myoelectric posthesis. So um, these are the, uh, in this way, you can, um, so I think that this is the last uh, topic I think that we can discuss. After that, we can have some questions. And uh, this is 3D printing. The basis is an application in the trauma and orthopedics. Uh, so this is the uh, born in uh, 3D printing. This is the introduction, not going to detail. So basically it depends on the, uh, the pre, uh, pre occasion CT or the MRI scan and the segment of once we have the picture, we have to, the picture is segmented by manually automatic or the semi-automatic manner and that consisting of assigning to each pixel of a level. So the box, this 3D picture, 3D picture is where 3D printing is required. Uh, 3D printing is, uh, is required to reproduce the exact uh, the structure already lost from our body. So, so in that case, so there are several uh, the scat file, 3D scan, DICOM image, or any type of image is used to make a, product, uh, there's a, there's a typical picture. So this is the different three, uh, 3D picture which is provided. And from the 3D picture to the software, we have make a 3D print. And from the 3D print, we can make this exact structure which is already lost from our body with the help of some different polymers, wax, or the metal used in proper actual model. So see, this is the example from this, uh, this, this CT scan uh, or the MRI is used to make a 3D picture like that. Mm, is a 3D picture. From the 3D picture, we can make a, this sort of structure which is already lost from our body it may be a, due to trauma it may be due to some neoplastic condition uh, so that can be produced outside the body and then from the body we can we can plan whether for you can, uh, can we can re-implant it or make it um, be reconstructed uh, depending on the situation like uh, see this is the structure you can see here this is the same certainly there is some post-traumatic deformity uh, so we have to uh, actually we have to correct it by the typical osteotomy so we may have made a um, 3d picture like that and from the 3d picture this scaffold is produced and let uh, see by this scaffold uh, we can make a um, uh, the osteotomy outside before uh, the before actual okay. planning so that how much osteotomy is done and that osteotomy is directly reproduced during the operation so to make a proper uh, reconstruction of the joint so this is the way we can use that so what are the applications basically the four main applications categories of the 3d printing technology uh, where there is a surgical pre-operative planning is crucial for internal fixation of the fractures which require the anatomic reduction uh, and like the pre uh, the, the pre-operative fracture or fracture dislocation especially the older fracture dislocation in the fresh fracture you can do the osteosynthesis very often but if it is an older fracture dislocation then the reproduction of this exact anatomy is extremely difficult so in that case 3d printing is required um, and not only that the, like the osteotomy and also the reconstruction and replacement of the structure as anatomical as possible. So that uh, it is helped by this 3D printing. Ne next is the patient specific implants like the sp patient specific jig may be used, uh, may be produced uh, in, in case of total knee replacements where there is significant deformity or significant loosening um, uh, or the orthosis can be, uh, can, be, can be prepared by this, uh, this application. Personalized instrument and the surgical guides can be used. Biomaterial constraint tissue specific scaffold on the small tissues uh, can be used uh, in this manner. Suppose say this is the way we can, if you how much uh, osteotomy is required, so that can be used. See the hill side lesion, how much uh, it's, the elevation is required that can be used uh, in this manner. fracture. This is a is a uh, this old uh, the stable fracture. Uh, so in that case, how it can be applied? How the uh, plates can be applied? Everything can be planned. That suppose it is a, a significant deformity, is old calcaneal fracture. 
that can be easily uh, prepared. These are uh, these processes. This is the processes of the calcaneum. That is a ceramic processes that can be easily prepared with the help of the three D scan. Three uh, D. Uh, uh, that is um, this another. This is about the spine also. So the, this uh, this this type of curvature. It's brought an exact curvature and also the alignment anatomically as as anatomical as possible can be prepared. Now the vestibular defects. So, it's, uh, so see there are the different uh, uh, even in the failure of the total hip replacements this sort of um, cups may be prepared uh, before uh, just going inside that and the, this is the uh, total knee replacements i've already told this uh, specific jigs can be used uh, can be or, or the, the typical uh, 3d printing can be used for exact cutting uh, so that the, the alignment is accurately maintained so now, again not only that this can be used for the tissue engineering tissue engineering that means the way the tissue is lost so in that case the scaffold is prepared with the help of the 3d printing and this case in inside the scaffold the mesenchymal stem cells may be added with that so that that will help in tissue the tissue growth inside the body so this is basically known as the tissue engineering so that can be that, that can regenerate the cartilage bone over the scaffold so they can uh, the, the, can stimulate the collagen formation alginate protein then coupled with the, uh, this uh, polyglycolic acid uh, so they can use that so on the scaffold is produced by the 3d printing along with that mesenchymal stem cells that can be used again that overall 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 some growth factors can be added so scaffold plus uh, see this is the tissue engineering so scaffold is produced by the 3d printing along with that the mesenchymal stem cells can be added this is stem cell therapy can be uh, the, it is it is mixed along with some growth factors can be added so that to make a the, so everything make it almost normal anatomy so this is basically known as the tissue engineering so i think i shall stop here and i can take some questions from the um, participants um, there are several uh, items so that i think i uh, the next class i can uh, talk with it, uh, other other topics over to janki yes sir okay uh, thanks uh, dr pal uh, as usual a lot of information there and i'm sure people will have time to go through it and um, clean out the important points um, so i'm sure there will be some questions yes sir um, uh, sir there is one question in the chat box by dr puspender uh, he, he has asked about recent approach on medical management for osteoarthritis yes i have another another slide so the recent management in osteoarthritis in, in the series so i can uh, share my uh, slide also there is a uh, several uh, the large questions are there just uh, to go. is a meniscus injury there is several techniques of meniscal injury i think it's almost like a whole new topic with a whole lot of things in it so yes 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 maybe a bit difficult to robotics the robotics actually yes there are several code like the auto autologous chondrocyte transplantation maybe something several, you can uh, cover in your next Class. <laughs> yes, that is that is large. Yes, definitely, there is a large uh, vast topic. Yeah. I think it is one word I can't answer it. So it is very difficult. Uh, so in the next class, I think definitely I can uh, use. Yeah. Okay. So for actually, for these people, maybe the next class will be after the exam. <laughs> Whenever. Okay. Uh, answer. The, yeah. The one thing, sir, which I have seen during, I think in 2021, they have asked about uh, the ACL reconstruction in female specifically, it, uh, female athlete. So mm -hmm. as you have mentioned about the ACL, why they have asked in recent advances and specifically for female athlete? Just because it's much more common in, in the female athletes than in the men. So women yes. tend to disrupt their ACL a lot easier than in men. And so they're trying to look at what are the reasons for this and uh, how to avoid it. So that's why it's become a topical thing. And uh, I think uh, one of the person they have messaged me that, that COVID is not a task, but I think it is quite important because the pandemic was recently over now. So they can ask any time. Uh, so, sir, uh, one more thing about, sir, 
in i think in every alternate paper they have asked about uh, something related to mycobacterium tuberculosis especially in recent paper recent advances paper like uh, the diagnosis uh, the Ajay. recent test what we are performing uh, Janki, so, yeah Janki, is is my slide is visible yes sir is is Yes, sir. So this is the actually answer. This is a, there are there are several uh, biologic um, options for the osteoarthrosis. Uh, so this is the autologous chondrocyte transplantation. In a nutshell, I am going to see that the so native primary chondrocyte as well as the stem cells such as uh, the mesenchymal stem cells modulating the chondrocyte metabolism, paracrine activity, entering the inflammatory milieu. They can have the absorbs from this slide also. Uh, medicine signaling cells as part of the the Arnold uh, Kaplan. And the pluripotent stem cells, they can be used. Uh, the majority of the cartilage repair studies with the mesenchymal stem cells had failed or produced disappointing results so far due to the number of the complicating factors, including the insufficient capacity of the chondrocyte differentiation, poor potential for immune modulation of the developmental hypertrophy. So this is the most important. And the biologic drugs, which are based on the therapies, there are some. This is basically the gene therapy of this osteoarthrosis. Uh, strategies for delivering the nucleic acids in the damaged and diseased tissues have been divided into two major areas: uh, the viral and the non-viral gene therapy. Viral factors as commonly include the adenovirus, hopeless simplex virus, retrovirus, and the lentiviruses for the transferring genes into the damaged or the diseased tissues. Are uh, they delivering the system for the non-viral therapies into the lipid-based systems like the few gene six DNA conjugates, ribosomes, and the peptides, messenger, messenger RNA? Conjugating system, which are easy to handle, safe for the vivo studies, and generally cost effective. Uh, so basically, these are targeted on the sustained delivery in the system. They are, they have they have actually these genes carrying the virus. They are injecting on this, and they 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 they, they, they causes the uh, the transformation of the cells uh, into the uh, the production of the good cells inside this inside the damaged uh, articular surface. So in this in this way, uh, they, they, how they works. Uh, so viral and non-viral approaches may be used to enhance the chondrogenic differentiation of the mesenchymal stem cells by stimulating it with the genes encoding the growth factors or the transcription factors required for the chondrogenic response in the mesenchymal stem cells. So mesenchymal stem, the stem cell therapy, it is loaded with virus, it is infected with the virus which is uh, carrying this uh, that genes. So, so that they will stimulate the mesenchymal stem cells, the production of this uh, good uh, the cartilage. Moreover, the gene therapy can enhance these mesenchymal stem cell immunomodulatory properties as well as stimulate the anabolic chondrocyte responses in the damaged cartilage or even the inhibit the entry chondrogenic factors. So this is where it is uh, described by Lolly et al. 2018. So in this way, uh, they, they, how it helps. Now the genetically engineering yes, vessel stem cells. So this, yes. So in this way, okay. So I think uh, I will stop here. Uh, mm, I can yeah so I, I think the way to probably answer that would be to first classify it into what medical management uh, the various uh, intraarticular injections and also try to clarify the roles in that none of these are actually proof therapies then go on to things like uh, biologicals inject uh, the uh, chondros autologous chondrocyte implantation the uh, various uh, even PRP sir yeah. grafts PRP is in part of biologicals yeah. then the yes. cartilage grafts okay osteocartilage grafts then you have complete transplantation of the joint where the entire cartilage and subchondral bone is replaced and you also have then in the surgeries like their advances in the osteotomies like we always talk about just open wedge and closed wedge osteotomies, but now there are these transcondylar osteotomies where you are also relatively moving one side of the joint more than the other. So they're almost like intra-article osteotomies. So the Japanese are very strong on that. Then you have uh, the developments in the replacements like unicondylar has again taken a, a recent, uh, especially with robotics coming in, then there's an improvement in uh, so all this, it comes into various uh, phases in the treatment of osteoarthritis and depending on what you get asked, you'll have to 
emphasize that part of the management team. Absolutely, absolutely. They are asking for the biology, biological treatment. Biological. So, ask for, so in biologicals, you will. So all these things come in biologicals. Now all the autologous uh, cartilage transplantation, they're all part of biology because you're taking out tissue, growing it, and then putting it back. And of course, uh, PRP, uh, stem cell therapy, all that comes. And a lot of it is unproven, but is being used based on clinical trials which are conducted by various companies or people. Who, but as yet, very few of the uh, um, associations are recommending them as established treatments. That's the other thing that you also need to point out when you answer these questions. Absolutely. So I think there are a lot of information about this class so in this class. So I think one time, if they can revise it, it will be more yeah. fruitful. I think they should go to it and watch it again in yeah. slow motion. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Right. Yes. okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pal. And uh, so until okay. next week, bye. And uh, I think it was very good and I'm sure that people have gained a lot from it. So Thank you very much, sir. Bye, yeah. everybody. Thank you, sir. Okay. That's great, sir. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir.